So from InsureTech with, with Johan and uh, Bas from, from Lamy, we now move to social media. And I'm delighted uh, this morning to welcome Emmanuel Lubanzadio from, from Twitter. Good morning, Emmanuel. How are you? Good morning, Andrew. Doing well. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Yeah, so we're delighted to, to, to welcome you here today and hear, hear some more uh, around Twitter and, and the great things you're doing. Um, if you first start, I mean, Africa's forecasted to be one of the most populated continents in the coming decades. Uh, youth bulge, many more millions to come online. Is uh, Africa the future for Twitter? I think that's that's quite a good question, but I do believe that Africa in general is uh, is, uh, is is quite a quite an interesting market for tech in general. But I think as it pertains to Twitter and uh, and the nature of our platform, I do believe so. Um, you know, maybe I can just briefly then even outline you know what what really makes Twitter particularly special for young people. So, you know, as all of you may know, and Andrew also, um, you know, through. Twitter is really you know, open. It's, uh, it's, 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 it provides actually different people, particularly young leaders, a platform you know, for leading movements on issues such as climate and social justice. And you know, us as a platform, Twitter is really empowering uh, different youths you know, to have a voice on different matters, you know, be it related to the climate or even social issues. Um, you know, Twitter is quite, uh, it's, it's the first place people go to to find what's happening in the real world. It's timely. You know, things things happen on Twitter. You know, real time is interactive. So, when you see things on Twitter, you know, you share, you feed, you respond, start a conversation. It's like a public square. So, based upon those, you know, characteristics of Twitter, uh, they do definitely match to Africa's dynamic market in general. Yes, yeah, certainly. I I think you know we've seen that this week with uh, events in in, in Lagos, um, where young people have been able to voice, you know, what's going on. Um, and yeah, it's it, it, it's real time news. I think you know, forty eight percent of people are are getting their news from radio in Africa, um, and I, I suppose Twitter is also sharing that real time story. Um, in, obviously, there's a double edged sword. Social media, as we know, has the potential for good and for bad, and people people like to spread information and also misinformation. So um, we've seen this across the. Uh, across the globe and in all social media, and we're not just talking about Twitter here, but how are you working to combat this misinformation? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a big issue that, you know, Twitter has been uh, kind of dealing first end. And I think particularly during this COVID pandemic, you know, it's uh, we can all agree that this pandemic is quite special and it's really, uh, you know, has a big impact on all of us. So. I would say, you know, more people than ever are coming to Twitter, you know, to learn about COVID, um, also connect friends, family, but also find reliable information. So the way we responded uh, to the challenges, you know, we have continued to update our policies and enforcement and, you know, really share more data to ensure experts and public and the public can better analyze our discussions around COVID and think continue to evolve. And really with the with this with the sole focus on really people really finding reliable information. So uh, we have done so not only by ourselves, so because our policies are not created by ourselves, but more so by building partnerships, by raising relief funds and grant pro bono advertising, you know, grants to support governments and non-profit organizations to ensure that people are really getting uh, the right messages from the right sources and also at the right time. So after all, you know, COVID has really taken uh, or forced our company to take a cross-functional effort you know, by uh, by unifying our engagement across uh, company, by leveraging partnerships, policies, product, uh, and philanthropic work to really uh, focus or rather encourage um, the dissemination of credible and reliable information. So we did have partnerships, or we do have partnerships with regional health authorities, and uh, based upon what they consider authoritative information, this is how we go, and, and based upon that logic, we do remove content that is either spreading misinformation related to COVID, um, uh, any harmful information that may encourage people to engage in harmful behavior. As, as an example, you know, we have uh, launched different campaigns, you know, such as the Wash Your Hands campaign, Let's Talk campaign, even hosted Q&As with the WHO, all in the spirit of really, um, so that people can actually find reliable information. So our engagement has not only been focused on the removal of harmful content, but more so on amplification of credible information two campaigns that I've just mentioned. And how, how are you measuring those campaigns? Obviously we could look at retweets and likes and things like that, but it, you know, what's the tangible measurement that maybe 
offline has been looked at around these campaigns and how successful they are. Yeah, I, I would say I would say definitely retweet is, is definitely uh, or the, the, the amount of numbers where people engaging responding is definitely a good measure to utilize. You know, in order to kind of track um, the way the conversation has been going and also amplified. But also, um, again, I, I've also mentioned that we 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 don't do things by ourselves. We have a, a council which we call a trust, a Twitter Trust and Safety Council, which comprises different organizations who provide us regular feedback. So I can just provide you an example, you know, different capacity building trainings that I've given with uh, the Africa Youth from the Coronavirus and also with AMREF Health, you know, which is uh, the largest NGO, health NGO in Africa based in Kenya. So this is the kind of conversation that we've been having where not only in terms of uh, measuring the retweets and tweets, but also getting credible feedback from those within our trust and safety council and other partners that I've engaged in. So, it's really a both measure of metrics, but also uh, feedback of those partner organizations that we've dealt with. So I should say to the audience, if you have any questions for, for Emmanuel, we'll try and get to them. If you can add them into the Q&A tab, which is on the right hand of the screen. He doesn't know Jack Dorsey's uh, travel arrangements. So let's 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 push that one aside um, and, <laughs> and, and, and let, let, let him come back and, and tell us when he's going to move to Africa. Um, <laughs> If we look at regulation, I mean, um, you know, we've seen a lot of countries in Africa, um, you know, shut down the internet, um, and I wouldn't even say regulation, but they, you know, silencing people. Um, how difficult is it for you as, as Twitter in, in these situations? Because obviously, you know, people don't want to incite in, incite violence around campaigns, and we've had we've had social media blockouts, but obviously. It's a double-edged sword. We're looking at people who want to share injustices and share what's going on and also share real-time information from polling and, and things like that. I mean, in your job, how difficult is it in terms of in terms of the, 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 the situation across some African countries where we've, we've even seen, you know, social media taxes being, being instigated? Um, you know, where do you see this going? And uh, unfortunately, it's your job to be head of public policy. And how, how hard is that, I mean, to, to try and have to push that free speech agenda with India. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it's, it's definitely a good point that you just raised. But I think it's always a matter of conversation and communication, right? So uh, you have men, you have mentioned you know social media. There are definitely certain issues attached to social media, such as misinformation that you have mentioned, which have uh, simultaneously also forced social media companies to really engage in conversation. I think this is definitely a good approach to take. You know, to just to really keep the communication channels open to really comprehend what kind of challenges the governments are facing, but at the same time, also us as a social media company coming in and to kind of explain our enforcement measures so that governments don't necessarily have to introduce, implement arbitrary policies that, you know, threaten to stifle innovation. And, you know, speaking of uh, just regulation in general, so I do agree, we are definitely seeing uh, worrying trends, you know, uh, regular action, trends and regular actions that have been taken and you know, I, I agree. Some some of those have been motivated, you know, by the urgent need to tackle COVID nineteen related misinformation. Uh, but at the same time, you also do have to realize, you know, the long term result could be an internet that is less open, an internet that is less free and less empowering for all. So, uh, I would I would definitely agree when 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 it comes to any talks on on regul regulation, uh, we we do have to keep in mind that the open internet is a core driver of economic and social development. You know, so and and uh, even looking into recent occurrences and uh, partnerships that I've mentioned, and I mean, if if it was not for the open internet, you know, um, Twitter would not be able to help people find reliable information, helping people connect with others, and and really enable people, you know, access to news, connection, and medical information, uh, which is really vital uh, during this special special time. So again, to kind of sum up my points, I would just say it's, it's really definitely a matter of having communications where the public and private sector uh, discuss issues, acknowledge issues, and then offering different capacity building activities, which we have, which I have been doing. So uh, if there are any issues coming up, you know, I usually uh, touch base with governments, provide capacity building trainings where I explain our policies, our enforcement measures, and different mechanisms where we could potentially partner on addressing misinformation, you know, be it COVID related or even election related. So. Yeah, those those are definitely the approaches that I would definitely sum up in terms of engaging with governments in general and, in my capacity. I'm with the governments. I mean, you know how 
how welcoming are they to your discussions around uh you know keeping the channels open and and, and um because you know ultimately closing the channels closes closes uh, opposition it closes uh questioning of what's going on and um, we've seen it across you know a lot of africa but i mean are governments receptive to you when you knock on the door or they say oh god here's this guy who's causing so many problems <laughs> Uh, I, I think this is something you probably have to ask the governments themselves, but I would, I would definitely say that we, uh, it, it, within my uh, respective role at Twitter, I do uh, have open communication channels with different governments that we engage because uh, at the end of the day, there, there has to be a conversation happening um, to where we do kind of emphasize, hey, the need to uh, keep the internet open, but also at the same time, us as a company taking responsibility in addressing this issue, not and then again, not only in terms of removing harmful content, but more so on on the front of really amplifying credible information, which we have been doing. So, uh, ver verification is quite a, a helpful tool in really ensuring that the people know that this information, which comes from this person or institution that is verified, uh, that it, it is credible. So, you know, there are obviously different me measures that you can apply, but I think. On the verification front, on the partnership front, launching campaigns together, but even giving trainings together. So I, I would say on the, on the capacity building front, uh, moving forward, this is definitely a point that I will have to address more, which I'm already doing. So there's a lot of conversation, trainings, you know. So it's it's really a give and take and learning from one another. But one, one thing I can definitely say that any any kind of arbitrary regulation uh, without any consultation is is generally harmful. And threatens to to impede further innovation, I would say. Yeah, I mean, one one positive point of that. I mean, the African Union are looking at developing positive policies. I think around the internet and around social media. Um, how 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 impactful it will be with, with regional governments, we don't know. But I mean, from Twitter's perspective, in terms of building policy, what what are the important things that you think you know the African Union should be including in these, and are they involving you within these within this framework and actually building this policy? Because obviously, a policy is no good. If we look at fintech, the regulator needs to work with fintechs for the policy really to work, because the fintechs know more about it than the regulator does. So, are you being involved in these discussions? I mean, are um, and what are the key points you think for for a policy to work for social media? Um, mm -hmm. and an open into and an open into that what do you think what do you think are the key ingredients that need to be yeah done? yeah i would say tw just twitter in general uh, supports a, a forward looking approach uh, to regulation you know one that really concerns the long term impact of the wider digital ecosystem and one that really protects the open internet and universal access and you know and so so based upon that premise um, this is when we really wish that regulators, you know, should avoid creating takedown frameworks and, and instead focusing on the amplification of credible information and recommendations in partnership with us. And I would say at the end of the day, Andrew, you know, uh, government, industry, NGOs must consider um, our, our a shared responsibility in offering the public more context, you know, and not only context, but also in de-amplifying certain types of content and ensuring you know, the reach of political speech is earned and not bought or manipulated. So I've even mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, the thing on capacity building activities, trainings, collaborations. Uh, I think one thing that this pandemic pandemic has shown that, you know, we all in the same boat. So I think this is the kind of approach that we need to take when it comes to building regulations where there needs to be a conversation. Um, so I, I even spoke at a social media and election conference in Cape Town, uh, I think it was in February or March, and there I had a number of conversations with different regulators, also African Union um, uh, representatives, where we had these kind of conversations. Um, so, you know, moving forward, this is really my hope that we can collaborate on, you know, uh, uh, on this shared responsibility aspect moving forward. Very good. Um, in terms of uh, questions from the audience, as I say, please keep your questions coming. I see a few coming through there. Please add them on the Q&A. Uh, tab on the right hand side of your screen or on your mobile i think it's on the bottom of your screen um one question from the audience there what digital skills should african youth pursue especially for educational purposes mm -hmm. not sure if that's a twitter a twitter not sure if that's yeah. a twitter uh, responsibility but yeah i think i think not this, this is definitely a good question i think this is definitely a question that industry and uh, the regulators definitely need to uh to tackle and respond to but i would say from a twitter perspective uh, we, we have a key focus on, on digital skills, you know, so 
some some of the uh, I had mentioned our uh, Twitter Trust and Safety Council, you know, which uh, usually brings together independent organizations from around the world that really advocate for safety and digital skills. How we as a platform can really help institutions on building these skills. So I would say digital skills are quite important, particularly your media literacy, and this is something that needs to be worked on, most in collaboration, which we actually do on. So. Uh, there's, there's this class where Amra Health and Twitter, well, including myself, are actually currently working on, which is based on health reporters, you know, creating the uh, or training the, the technical digital skills of health reporters. And I think that's the same approach that my colleagues in other regions are taking, where they are partnering with UNESCO. We have developed like a handbook on uh, media literacy, you know, so, so uh, there, there's definitely a focus where we as an industry need to be responsible also and take responsibility, which we are doing and providing or utilizing some of those technical skills that we can provide uh, in helping uh, the continent or even people in general uh, obtaining digital skills. But this is definitely something, one of our core areas, digital skills and media literacy. Um, one other question there. I mean, who decides from the audience, who decides what is credible and what is not? Being a self-appointed arbiter, even with noble intentions, leaves itself open to inherent bias. Um, yeah, where do you sit on that one? I mean, uh, how how can Twitter? I know we're looking even at the U.S. election right now, um, mm. and and Twitter's you know taking down taking down posts that are obviously fake news and misinformation. Um, mm. How how do you balance the two? I mean, how do you balance you know taking down stuff that that Twitter doesn't agree with, and then other people actually say, well, we agree with that. Yeah, uh, well, we have our Twitter uh, uh, rules and policies, right, which which really serve as our I would say as a morning star to kind of um, see what is in breach of our policies or not. But I think COVID has really provided this good example because, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Twitter doesn't just uh, conduct or uh, implement any policies on our own. We have a tr trust and safety council, which brings together different in independent organizations. Uh, but also just in terms of COVID, we, are, we have worked with op authoritative sources, you know, such as the WHO, and uh, Amr of Health, you know, recently held a webinar with Africa CDC on the on the topic of guideline adherence and misinformation. So everything is really in collaboration on, particularly as regards COVID, uh, what is what is what is deemed what is considered credible by authorities, and this is the approach that we've taken in our enforcement. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. So we don't see us as arbitrary of truth, but rather we we do enforce these policies and rules in collaboration with organizations and bar regional bodies that have been considered credible okay well look emmanuel it's been it's been really informative um we'd love to ask you more questions like when is jack dorsey coming but i'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll let you i'll let you off the hook in that one um, i know there's a lot more to come from twitter across the continent we, we look forward to hearing more from you at, at maybe in africa tech summit in kigali when we get back there definitely so, so thanks so much emmanuel and we wish you well Thank you very much. I really appreciate you guys and take care. Bye-bye. Take care.